Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Film for Fans podcast, the podcast from movie fans for movie fans. I'm your host, Ryan Dunlevy. That's my co-host, Rob Dunham. Hey, everybody. Hey, it's hey. Friday. It is. Woo. We are recording this Friday. <laughs> you may not be listening to it on Friday. We're yeah. recording this on Friday. It's always our goal, but sometimes, you know, life. Yeah. Sometimes things yeah. don't happen. So, right. so thanks for listening to us whenever you have the chance to. We have we yes. get a chance to record. And for sticking with us when we, you know, sometimes record on Sunday. Or, or just fail. Monday. Or yeah. it, something doesn't work out. So <laughs> thank you for that. But hopefully you're enjoying it. And we have another good show for you if you do happen to enjoy our show. Uh, we will, of course, give you the box office update. Uh, we will discuss, in honor of Father's Day, the best and worst movie fathers. So that should be fun. And, of course, we will hit up our watch list, movies we've watched over the last week. But now, let's get back to the box office. Give so, me some good news. Yes. Box office was up 65%. That's what I like to hear. Last week from the previous week. Um, most of this is due to one movie, and most of that is due to Ride or Die. The Bad Boys Ride or Die finished number one at the box office, pulling in $56.5 million. Uh, very good showing for um, that type of movie on week one. Number two was Garfield uh, did $10 million in its third week in release. Garfield uh, was down 149 theaters. Uh, from the previous week. If finished number three at $7.8 million in its fourth week, that one is coming up closer to $93 million. We'll see if it gets to $100 million or not. Uh, there's probably a decent chance it'll hang around long enough to get to get um, $100 million. Uh, another new entrant to finish fourth in the box office, and that was The Watchers. Finished at just over seven million dollars in its first week in theaters, and Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes did five point four million dollars in its fifth week, and it is rapidly approaching one hundred fifty million dollars. Do you have where uh, Furiosa is? Uh, I believe it was seventh. Wow! It fell out of the top five. Yeah, I was going to comment on that. Furiosa fell out of the top five this week. So that would also be in its third week. Because yeah. it came out at the same time Garfield did. Yeah. Man, it, is, I, I, it makes me sad. I, I know we talked about this repeatedly, but I just, I don't understand it. I, don't. I know. I don't understand it either. <laughs> I saw someone say, well, I can understand why people don't like it. It was mediocre. I'm like, what are you talking about? What movie were you watching? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Clearly you are not long new internet movie person as immortan joe would say you're mediocre <laughs> <laughs> sorry if that person listens to the podcast no i'm not actually sorry you are mediocre <laughs> <laughs> or as the kids would say it's mid it's mid. <laughs> uh we think the kids still say that you know we might be a little behind yeah who knows yeah I'll sometimes say things to my coworker who is like 20 years younger than me about, yeah, the kids say blah, blah, blah. And she'll be like, yeah, the kids stopped saying that six months ago. Like, mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, you know, it is what it is. Uh, also on the radar, finishing in the top 10, because the top 10 is what's included in like the box office, how it did versus the previous weeks. Mm. Like the way the, the box office mojo calculates it. It's based mm -hmm. on the top 10 movies that week versus the top 10 movies previously. And finishing in the top 10 were Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, hmm. and Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers. Wow. They were back in theaters uh, this previous, this past week. And 2.5 million for Fellowship of the Ring and 1.9 million for The Two Towers. Nice. Those things are still pulling down yeah, good amount of money in theaters and re-releases. Uh, that's pretty impressive, especially when it didn't come with a giant campaign launch. Right. I mean, there was some advertisement for it, but yeah, that's really impressive. Nice. Um, any comments on the box office? Uh, I mean, I already made my big one. Uh, yeah. I'm just disappointed. Yeah. I'm disappointed in all of you. But, uh, <laughs> 
Uh, I'm not surprised whatsoever at Bad Boys' mm. success. Um, they they have a a winning formula. It seems there mm-hmm. with uh, just the style of movie, and there's a built-in audience who really actually uh, likes these characters, especially yeah. uh, Martin Lawrence and Will Smith together. Just seem like a really good team that people like to go see the theater. I know what I saw that this last this week on mm-hmm. Tuesday. So this would be the after the weekend. And there were probably 30 people in the theater on a Tuesday night mm. to see this. So I wouldn't be surprised if this didn't have a massive drop off. Um, Interesting. Yeah. You know, going into the second week. So we'll see. Okay. Yeah. I, I think it's the kind of movie like uh, it's a movie I saw and I would recommend to people. Mm-hmm. So I think it's um, a movie that might get recommended to people and it might not have a huge drop. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it will be interesting to see because as you'll see out this week, there's only really one movie that's going to make any money this coming weekend, and it's a kid's movie. Mm -hmm. So I think that also will lend itself very well to Bad Boys having a very soft landing on the second week. Yeah. Um, I would would anticipate, you know, better than average for its drop-off rate for week two. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, I don't have I don't have a, too much to say about this. There's going to there's it's kind of all over the place. You got an action movie, you got some kids movies in there. Um, so there was kind of something for everybody, and you kind of see that in in the way the distribution happened. You know, you got seven million, almost eight million, ten million. Like the middle chunk is all kind of the same. Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes was a little lower, but it's been out for over a month now. So I'm surprised. I'm not surprised to see that the new movie gets the big bump and everything else is kind of in the middle. I'm guessing we'll see something similar this week. Yeah. So this is not um, related to this week's box office. We'll talk. We can talk Mm -hmm. about this more later, but just something that I saw that. Yeah. Kind of. I'm not sure how I feel about if this is actually accurate or not. Okay. Um. So Quiet Place Day 1 is going to come out June 28th. That's in two weeks. Yes. And Deadline, who does a lot of Mm -hmm. box office projections and and things like that, is projecting that this movie will make $40 million opening weekend. Interesting. Which seems like a lot to me. It's been a pretty successful franchise. It is on the thriller horror level. Mm Mm-hmm. So that will decrease the audience a little bit. Hmm. So I think we've been seeing like if you make yeah. a solid horror movie, you're looking at like 20 to 30 million dollars. Yeah. Seems to be. But it does have a broader yeah. audience than just traditional horror. So I think that it has the potential to reach a bigger audience. It's just been hard to predict because movies that we think are going to do well just haven't. Mm-hmm. And. I mean, I certainly think they thought yeah. they thought Furiosa was going to do better than oh for theater. sure. So, um, who's to know? I mean, this is like they came out with this article last week. Like they have a th- yeah. they they do three week tracking like projection mm-hmm. on movies based on test screenings, based on word of mouth that they're hearing, and I mean they're saying forty plus million dollars, and I don't know. It just seems like a high number to me for uh, granted, like you said, has a little more of a broader yeah. range, but it's but even. With that, that it being a sequel or a prequel, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. um, not the first movie in the series. I don't know if that helps it. I think more. it. I think the traditionally speaking, franchises have done well because they have a built-in audience that will go see the movie, whether that individual movie is good or not. Um, which has helped. Which is one of the reasons why it got saturated with franchises mm-hmm. because they were kind of money makers for a long time. Now that's changed a little bit. So I don't know. It's, it's going to be really hard to predict. Yeah. Especially this summer, things have not shaken out at the start of the summer, like you would have expected. And the audiences have not been like flocking to the theaters yeah. in massive numbers. Yeah. Um, it's box office tracking in general is just very fascinating to me because is. I mean, you can, they they are able to very accurately by like Friday night yeah. tell you what a movie's gonna make that weekend mm-hmm. based on people's ticket buying to that point. Yeah. When you've still got two whole days left in the weekend. Yeah, there's just enough patterns and they've been yeah. doing this for long enough 
But, you know, I don't know. Some stuff changes. I, I wonder, we've seen lots of changes in the audience patterns in terms of what movies they go see and what movies they don't. I wonder if that has in any way affected that model mm-hmm. of if it has messed with the model of, well, if we know this many tickets sell Friday, then yeah. Yeah, we can project the weekend. Yeah. I wonder I wonder if it's messed with that or if that's stayed the same, yeah. even if audiences are showing up or not. I'm a, I'm a little fascinated. I think I need to I think I need to do some research. I need to to either write something for the site or or we have a little more of a deep dive on just the history of the box office yeah. itself. Like how they start tracking this stuff. Like <laughs> how do they do it now? How has yeah. it evolved over the years? Because it certainly hasn't stayed the same. Yeah. And you're right. Like, are they using like how, how swiftly are these metrics updated? I would think, yeah. I would think in the age that we live in now, things mm-hmm. are probably very quickly changed. Yeah. And how they the, project like, things. Any, any single data set, benefits from a longer time frame mm-hmm. like when you've been tracking something for a longer period of time then you have a better sense of the ebbs and flows of it so that you're less caught off guard um the downside is that it makes a model that's heavily based on history um very so sub- if there's rapid changes in it then it becomes very subject it can yeah. get out of date really quickly i mean then you have like complete anomalies like Barbie and Oppenheimer, yeah, that just blow everything out of the water because yeah. there was no anticipation, no, of what happened. Yeah, so I and I wonder how much, how much they're they're able to track non ticket related things when it comes to projections, like mm-hmm. engagement on social media, yeah. views on trailers on YouTube, um, mm-hmm. just conversation on like twitter slash x yeah you know i wonder how much that factor how much they're able to take into that we need to find a way to combine the names twitter and x into one name so yeah. that i can not have to say both things i, I have an idea how we call it twitter anyway <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to go down right <laughs> um but yeah yeah it's it, it's fascinating to see what happens in tracking this stuff this is one of the things that we started doing when this well, after sometime after this podcast mm-hmm. started, because mm-hmm. there was no box office to track yeah. when we started yeah. this. But it's been one of the more fascinating things about doing this is being able to see those trends over a period of time. All right. So let's move on to movies opening this weekend. There are three movies, one main release and then two some two smaller releases. The main release for this weekend is Inside Out 2. Yes, the Pixar Disney movie is back Inside Out 2. Uh, rated PG, runtime of an hour and 36 minutes. And this movie follows Riley, who is now in her teenage years, as she encounters new emotions. Uh, lots of stars in this one. Uh, some of the main ones are Amy Poehler, Maya Hawke, and Kensington Tallman. And uh, many, many more, if you want to take a look at the cast. Um so this is a follow-up on the original movie, uh, Inside Out, which was highly successful. It was another one of those in the long Pixar run of dominance mm-hmm. before Disney. And in a little bit until Disney got enough hands in it. But um, they're, now, they're now back with a sequel. And it was a really imaginative. The original one was very imaginative. Um personifying a little girl's emotions as she moves to a new place and starts a new school. And it really came off, I thought, really incredibly well. And now they're back for the second one, now handling teenage emotions. Um, what do you uh, what do you make of this? So I there, there's certainly an argument to be made for this movie doesn't need to exist. Mm-hmm. However, Toy Story 4 also didn't need to exist, and it was really good. <laughs> so I... I think there is a lot of potential for this to be a good movie. I mean, you've got all the main voice people are back, so it's very much the same. It's going to be the same kind of feel. Yeah. Um, but then you're adding these other characters voicing different emotions. Mm-hmm. And I I think one thing that really benefits it, like you said, you're looking at the Pixar before Disney thing, and I think there's going to be a lot of carryover of people who – will associate inside out with that instead of like what's 
some of the stuff that's come out in between. Yeah. I think that this will be a little bit um, safe from the repercussions of like some of the failures Mm -hmm. there that Disney Pixar have had together because people will think back to the original one yeah. and they'll want to see the new one. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think it'll, I, I expect it, anticipate it to do pretty well, especially because you're looking at like, this is um, either the first or second weekend where like all the kids are actually out of school Yeah. now. So I think this is going to be like a big driver for families to go out to the movies. It will be interesting to see for me because the first one hit kind of the core demographic that age kids so you have parents and that age kids now at at the time those pixar movies were being attended by most everybody it will be interesting to see now that the main character is a teenager how that will affect like how popular will it be for younger kids will there be enough in there for younger kids to be able to relate to the story real right to the character now that she is older okay so i i, I think yeah. we need to start including this when we talk about movies coming out like the some of the projections okay because i'm finding this fascinating okay so the hollywood reporter this is 23 hours ago yeah just said that inside out is tracking to make 90 plus million dollars oh, opening weekend wow okay which would be the biggest opening of the year for any movie yes yes it and would. would be a huge opening for an animated movie yeah if it's projected so, to make 90 million, yeah. that is that is big. That yeah. is a big, big number, yeah. especially in the current climate. So yeah, I mean, because we're we're talking about bad boys like being successful now yeah. 56. So 90 is like a, a whole different stratosphere. Yeah. Which would say that one, people are associating with old Pixar. Mm-hmm. Two, this is enough people remember the other one fondly enough that it's drawing a wider range of audience than what you've seen for some of the other yeah. animated movies. I, th- I think that's a very good point because you're going to have some people who were like maybe slightly older kids who are in their like mid teens now mm-hmm. who generally wouldn't necessarily want to go to mm-hmm. a movie like that but because of their connection with the original and the characters they want to see it continued yeah yeah so that's uh that's that's really fascinating yeah and i mean yeah. we're pretty close it's the weekend now so yeah for them to say that just yesterday i think they're feeling pretty solid about yeah it doing really well yeah that's really interesting yeah i like it Okay, um, other two smaller releases here. Uh, there's the movie Treasure. It's rated R, runtime of an hour and 52 minutes. And this is an American journalist, Ruth, who travels to Poland with her father, Edik, to visit his childhood places. But Edik, a Holocaust survivor, resists reliving his trauma and sabotages the trip, creating unintentionally funny situations. Uh, two main stars here are Lena Dunham and Stephen Fry. Uh, the last one is Relentless Patriot. The Relentless Patriot. This is not rated. They didn't give any runtime, even on the theater. <laughs> they didn't give any runtime for this. Uh, it's a documentary. Just come in and sit down. And just just come and sit, sit down. Well. Maybe you're here for 15 minutes. Maybe you're here two hours. Yeah. Maybe you're here four hours. Who hey, it is relentless. So. It is relentless. <laughs> uh, and this is a documentary about American artist and activist Scott. Lobato's 30-year career promoting patriotism through art is chronicled, detailing challenges faced in his mission to unite Americans via artwork and advocacy. So if you're into that documentary, there you go. Uh, Either of those two appeal to you? Not really. Yeah, me neither. (laughs) But there's plenty out there if neither of those appeals to you. There's plenty out there to see right now, including Furiosa. Go see Furiosa. Yes, please. Um, And now let's move on to our discussion element for the today. Our discussion for today uh, in honor of Father's Day this weekend is the best and worst movie fathers. We did a similar thing for mothers around Mother's Day. So we're back uh, for around Father's Day. So each of us is going to choose like two ish um, for the best category and the worst category. And we'll go back and forth on these. Which one do you want to start with? uh why don't we start with the worst okay let's go right for the baddies okay 
Um, so the worst, I'm just gonna say uh, Darth Vader uh, in general. <laughs> Why, why pray tell was Darth Vader a bad father? Uh-huh. That's a great <laughs> question, Ryan. Um, so it's really interesting because I, I think that Darth Vader, prob- Anakin Skywalker probably thinks he's a good father hmm. or wants to be a good father because he wants to, his son to be included in his domination of the galaxy. He wants him to be a part of things. But the fact that they had to literally hide his children from him when they were born so that he didn't kill them or, you know, twist them over to a wrong way of thinking, the dark side. Uh, that's not a great mark on the on dad. No. There. No, probably not. <laughs> um, one of the most iconic moments in cinema, obviously, Empire Strikes Back, where he tells Luke that he is his father. You know, and the visceral reaction to that from the audience of gasping or being shocked and hearing, you know, Luke himself respond with, no, you know, it, it's not really what you're looking for when you tell someone you're their dad. <laughs> also, it might have a little bit more, you know, positive vibes if you haven't already cut your son's arm yeah prior to that yeah he seems like a little bit of tough love yeah kind of guy emphasis on the tough yeah um (laughs) limb removal generally is not great parenting technique some people who are not designed to be fathers and i'm gonna go ahead and say anakin skinwalker (laughs) is not really designed to be a, a father yes in fact it is instead of him saving his son uh, it ended up having to be the reverse, yes. where his son had to bring him back at the end. Which is really interesting because you've got this whole long history of him being evil mm-hmm. and not having a good relationship with his son, son mo- mostly not having a relationship at all with his son because he didn't know he existed. Um, to the point where when he's dying, his son is like right there by his side, trying to comfort him, trying mm-hmm. to encourage him. Says a lot more about Luke's character than it does about yeah. Anakin's and just about the character. nature of familial bond. Yeah, you know, there's there's a connection there, even if you really haven't had much of a relationship, or your relationship has been entirely adversarial. Yeah, at that point, um, what's the thing about this? Is there any? Do you think there's a, like a Pinocchio element to that? Because Pinocchio similarly had to go rescue his father. Hmm. I don't know. Just leave that out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the ones I will pick for worst dads is I will pick Lester Burnham from American Beauty. Mm. Um, he is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, he basically kind of goes crazy, uh, becomes entirely self indulgent, then proceeds to, um, you know, start getting into drugs, ignore his daughter, uh, basically make his daughter's friend the object of his desire. And <laughs> then on top of which, um, anger and alienate the neighbors and get himself killed. Mm-hmm. Uh, but not before alienating his entire family. So I think all of that constitutes being a bad father. <laughs> but the main the main reason is because it was he went to a level where he no longer cared about his family to the point where he only cared about himself and his own whims and indulgences at that mm-hmm. point. I mean, whenever you start obsessing over your daughter's high school friends, really yeah. not a great sign of good parenting. Probably not. <laughs> also, as we talked before, it's a little um seems to be a little autobiographical on the scale of <laughs> Kevin Spacey being a weirdo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I can't speak to Kevin Spacey's real life ability as a father. I don't know if he is one. I but, don't know. but um and in that movie he sure is not a good, great one. Yeah. No, definitely not. <laughs> All right. Give me another uh do you have two for each or just one for each? I have two for each. Okay. All right, so what's uh, what's your other worst? Uh, my other worst one is uh, The Shining. Ah, yes. <laughs> okay. So The Shining, I believe it's uh, Jack Torrance is the father's name. I need to look that up quick. It's, it's, uh, I had it right here. 
and this is the character played by Jack Nicholson. Yes. Right? Yeah. The one who uh, crashes through a doorway with an axe and says, here's Johnny. Um, because at this point he has lost his ever living mind and is attacking his own family because he has gone insane. Um, thinks he sees and hears things, has visions of hedges coming to life, has visions of people in bathtubs, just all kinds of weird stuff going on with him. And what's interesting, what what makes it even worse is that they're only in this position because he took this job to work at this hotel, the Overlook Hotel. Uh, Yeah, Jack Torrance is his name. Um, I I just want to read a section from this Rolling Stone article because if you haven't seen The Shining... Yeah. Um, This tells you all you really need to know about why he's a bad father. No matter how drunk our father got, he never blamed us for how his novel wasn't coming along or murdered our middle-aged psychic friends with an axe or chased us through a snow-covered topiary maze. (laughs) But Jack Torrance does. (laughs) Uh, Our dad never tried to correct us while rivers of blood gushed out of haunting elevator doors or slammed through a door with an axe. What Jack Torrance does. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you if you want to watch something that'll make you terrified of the concept of just having a father in general, watch Shining. It's uh yeah, he starts off as his really, you know, he's he's a mm-hmm. decent guy, but he's also got this underlying current of there's something unsettled about him in in, yeah. in the book, um, and they they briefly like they talk mention this in the movie, but it's more of a big deal in the book. Um, before all this stuff happens, he gets fired from his job at the college where he's working and he actually breaks his son's arm mm. because he gets mad at him for messing up some of his papers and he like grabs him really quickly, but too hard. Um, and actually like really injures him. Mm. But his, his family like loves him and they like a lot of it is tied to his drinking. Yeah. And he's trying to move on from that and be a better person and not indulge in that but then when he gets to this hotel one of the places he always ends up is back at the bar the the bar kind of inhabited by a ghost um who just keeps on so is the is he really there or not <laughs> i don't know but uh the the drinking is really there and, yeah um it only aids in his descent into insanity but i i mean if you if you need to watch a horror movie the shining is a good one to watch when it comes to absolutely pathological um, disturbing behavior by an individual because that's really what the movie is about his descent into madness and the complete impact that has on not only his children but his entire family and by virtue of the entire hotel yeah um, so the second one I'll go with is um, from Lord of the Rings Return of the King and that's Denethor mm. Denethor, steward of Gondor um Horrible, horrible father. Okay. You do see him a little bit in the extended editions of like the Fellowship of the Ring. I think at least he has a brief appearance in the extended edition. Um, But primarily, you know him from the Return of the King. And he hits a lot of things. Favoritism. um, Definitely clearly favors one son over the other and is not shy about it Mm -hmm. um then proceeds to um openly wish that his younger son was dead instead of his older son um then drives his younger son to basically go on a suicide mission uh to try and win his affection and on top of which then when he's only injured instead of dead in his madness, Denethor tries to set him on fire and burn him alive. Uh, in addition, he's just an absolutely horrible person and slipping into madness himself. Mm-hmm. Um, all not good traits of fatherhood. <laughs> but I think in particular, and, and this messes with both of his kids, and you can see this, like he has he has naked ambition, which is what drives him to send um er- or not aragorn um to send his oldest son which i'm now 
Sean Bean's character. A sealed door. Sealed door. No. No? No, not a sealed door. No. no, he's the... Um, why am I blanking out on his name? Um, yeah, I will keep talking and then maybe we'll look it up. For some <laughs> reason, I know the character. I just can't, you know, names escape me at the moment. Oh, Boromir. Boromir, yeah. thank you. Uh, Boromir, yes. <laughs> so Boromir, he's the one who sends Boromir on the explicit mission to basically steal the ring. Mm-hmm. Boromir, like, then is on the fence back and forth because of the influence of his father on this, but he kind of knows it should be destroyed and it ends up ruining Boromir and indirectly leading to Boromir's death. Um, But then just the, the impact that has on his younger son and his younger son actually managing to have some of the strength that his older brother did not um, is fascinating. So um, yeah, and, Denethor, yeah, and, and talk about a account. Uh, I'm not going to go off on a tangent about like the whole character, but talk about um, compare and contrast Denethor with Theoden, mm-hmm. the king of Rohan, mm-hmm. who you see in the second and third movies, and his reaction to his sons and you know, just his passion and love mm-hmm. for his sons. Uh, that's one of the things I love about just the series in general. Mm-hmm. Like, there's so much in there. Yeah. And I think it portrays often the exact wrong person is in charge at the exact wrong time. And you see that on a, such a regular basis. And and Denethor is that man. And in addition to being a bad steward, he's also a terrible father. All right. So let's move on to... Um, some of the best fathers represented in movies. Uh, Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones' father, played by Sean Connery. So we're uh, we're you know we're we're okay with the uh, you know <laughs> the sleeping with the same woman thing. Sure, here. sure. Why not? <laughs> no one said he was a perfect father. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Fair enough. <laughs> but uh, hello, Junior. Um, <laughs> The, the thing that I think makes uh, Sean Connery's character a, a good father is that he is relentless in his encouragement of and support of his son and his desire to, you know, see the world, explore. Even, even when things seem to move a little bit far out of his comfort zone, <laughs> he doesn't abandon his son, although, you know, he may do other stupid stuff. Uh, <laughs> uh, but... Uh, yeah, Indiana Jones and which one is the main one he's in? The um, the Last Crusade. The Last Crusade, yes. And I think about the the scene with the motorcycle and the chase scenes and Sean Connery trying to hold on his hat <laughs> as all the stuff is going on. Um, but one one thing that a father I think really does if he is a good example to his son is. He he in, he encourages a sense of adventure and wonder in them and encourages a sense of wanting to try out or figure out some of the things that their father did before them. And yeah. I think you see that a lot in Indiana Jones's character, looking back at mm-hmm. his father. Yeah, and and he's he's a perfect example played by Sean Connery. Um that you don't have to be a perfect father to be able to to do that because there, i mean henry jones senior mm-hmm. uh, has some flaws like he talks about how you know they have they sit down to have the conversation he's like you didn't even talk to me about after my mother's death or or something along the lines of like you taught me that like something someone who's dead in a foreign country 500 miles away was more valuable but you can see that passion that he passed on to his son and the fact that there's genuine love and affection there and the chemistry between those two characters in that movie is fantastic mm. like it makes that movie so much better yeah uh because of how good they are together and sean connery is somehow like 30 years older than he actually was in real life <laughs> in that movie sean connery is one of those guys who was like old yeah like right away and then seemingly was like just old forever yeah yeah gene hackman was another one who's mm-hmm. like that it was like old and it was old forever um it, it is it is definitely a thing that like 40 year old men in like 
the 1970s and 80s look like they were 70 year old men yeah. <laughs> that is absolutely a thing yeah. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced of that um all right so the first one I will pick uh is Mac McGuff from Juno hmm. Mac McGuff from Juno um the way he is able to you know, he's obviously not happy with his daughter's decision making and the situation she finds herself in. Um, but it's very clear that he cares for his daughter, that he wants what's best for her, and that he's willing to do uh, what he needs to to support her. And um, there's genuine care and affection there. And there's genuine encouragement, which is something yeah. that, you know, is not always portrayed in movies um, when kids make bad mistakes. Um, it is more often than not in movies that you see, uh, and it's it's a classic movie trope that the parents don't understand type thing. And this is a dad who who um, is very who is not happy but very supportive and very encouraging and knows how to walk that line uh between being being a disciplinarian and someone who uh has a genuine relationship and care and wants the best for his daughter mm -hmm. and so i think he really does represent a great dad and uh you know he's just a great actor <laughs> yeah i think too often uh the harsh side of parenting mm -hmm is shown and to have compassion in a situation where your kid really did do something stupid yeah um now granted but well the good thing about it is he is very forthright and honest about it too he's mm -hmm. not just oh it'll be okay yeah and, and we all make mistakes like he makes sure she knows that you know she screwed up yeah. but that he is there with her to help her through it that she's not by herself yeah so I think a lot of times when we make mistakes, we can feel like we're by ourselves. Mm -hmm. There's not support there to back us up. Yeah. Um, my uh, my other good one would be uh, Finding Nemo. Mm -hmm. Marlon. Yeah. His mm -hmm. father. Mm -hmm. uh, the only reason I really need to say for this is if you're willing to swim across the ocean with Ellen DeGeneres to save your son, then you must really love your dude. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Right. <laughs> um, to get a little more into detail, I, um, Marlin, the character finding you know, his mm -hmm. dad does virtually everything within his power to find his son. Yeah. Uh, braving circumstances that he would have thought impossible before he started swimming across the mm -hmm. ocean. Uh, just finding in the first place where his son even was. And then taking risks far above and beyond anything he could have comprehended. Yeah. Before he set off on the journey to find his son, um, being single-minded in that pursuit and devotion to his son. Uh, I know it's just a fish, but uh, arguably the best, if not one of the best fathers in any movie ever. So just be more like a fish. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, so I will go with, um, let's do Chris Gardner from pursuit of happiness. Uh, this is a, it's a very good movie. It's a tough movie at times, but it's a very good movie. Um, because the man who finds himself down, um, single parent at that time, um, no job. You know, losing his house, losing his apartment. And how do you take care of your son under those circumstances? How do you continue to strive forward and do what's best? And and his love and his care for his son and his trying to protect his son um, is the motivation that continues to drive him forward. And his his desire to see his son succeed and to to become what he needs to be to get his son what he needs um is is amazing so he he's able to show his son model for his son dedication and determination the value of education uh character and how to treat people 
and he's really, really good and and showing his son his dreams like allowing his son to dream and showing his son what it looks like to pursue dreams is just an incredible incredible example of of leading your family through a very very difficult time Mm -hmm. yeah uh the piece of advice a friend gave me once was uh never let your storm become your children's storm yeah and i think that's a perfect example of that because he knows the reality of everything about their situation but it doesn't mean that you need to transfer all of that baggage onto your kid yourself yeah you know um there's something about being an adult where you have to be the adult Mm -hmm. at times yeah and i think that movie is a perfect example of that yeah and and like you're saying kind of taking on that burden yourself so that your children don't have to. Um, There's a selflessness and that's involved in that. And um, it's not often seen in a lot of dad characters. Mm -hmm. Um, Dad and sometimes you can say men in general are generally not always well portrayed uh, in a positive manner. And, And some of the ones we've talked about here are good examples of ones that have. And so they're great, they're great examples there. And and of course, the nice thing about Chris Gardner and the pursuit of happiness is based on a real guy. It's based on a real story. And and so, I mean, who knows how much of like what the movie embodied was present in Chris Gardner, the actual person. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you'd like to think some of it was. Yeah. And and so um that's what makes it special as well. Do you got another one or anything else? I, I don't know. Okay. Um, I think it's good. Yeah. I will just say, we did not mention Brian Mills from Taken, but... <laughs> um, He will find us. He will find us. And he will kill us. <laughs> so please send out. <laughs> so do not mess with his family. Yeah. Okay. Do not mess yeah. with his family. And if you, um, if you happen to have a, a father or father figure in your life, let them know you appreciate them. Absolutely. Yep. Tell your father, happy Father's Day. And all of you out there who are fathers, happy Father's Day to you. All right, we'll conclude with our watch list. Movies we've watched over the last week. Rob, what you got? I've got to pull up my app because I like actually watched a lot of movies <laughs> and I haven't been recently. Um, so last week, uh, I watched The Watchers. Mm. That was last Friday after we recorded the podcast. Um, I enjoyed it quite a bit. I think that there was... A, a lot of not great reaction to it from people who thought the plot line was a bit confusing or um, not that great, but I thought they did a pretty good job of translating the book into the movie. And I do wonder if my understanding of the story from the book mm-hmm. impacted how I viewed the movie, meaning I didn't need all the gaps filled in yeah. for me. So I'm wondering if you have not read the book, if they're, are gaps in the movie that wouldn't make sense mm. to you otherwise. Because so, some of the more detail of the lore and things that they went into the that went into the book did not present itself in the movie. So I could see it being a little confusing or feeling like maybe a little herky jerky mm-hmm. if if you didn't have that background information. Yeah. But I thought it was good. I thought it was mm-hmm. a very good um debut, uh directorial debut. Yeah. For M. Night's Daughter, um, I would recommend it. Um, I also saw The Usual Suspects. Yeah. <laughs> who is Kaiser Soze? Today? <laughs> Such a good movie. I saw The Usual Suspects with someone who had never seen The Usual Suspects, oh, which is always my better. favorite. Yeah. Um, they they figured it out by the end, but still, I think even with that, um, I just love I love the last the last couple minutes of that movie. Yeah. And I will not say anything else about them because I don't care how old this movie is. I'm never going to spoil it because I want people to see what happens themselves. Yeah, for sure. Cause it's just, it's brill- It's brilliantly written and acted. Yeah. Um, and Kevin Spacey is phenomenal in it. Mm-hmm. No matter how you feel about him as a person. Yeah. Um, I saw the Garfield movie. Okay. Unf- unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will say I laughed a lot because, you know, most kids animated movies, you're going to laugh a lot, mm-hmm. but that doesn't mean it was a good movie. It's very, I, I, I rated it two and a half out of five stars. Okay. So very much an average mm-hmm. kids movie to me. Um, 
I kind of wanted to rate it negative five stars for the fact that it's succeeded more than Furiosa. <laughs> <laughs> um, we can move on from that. Um, uh, the Garfield movie might be moving into the uh, Indiana Jones and the King of the Crystal Skull levels of hatred very quickly. <laughs> um, uh, I watched Pirates of the Caribbean Dead Man's Chest okay. as the second of the original Pirates of the Caribbean trilogy. And I I really like most of what was done in the Pirates movies. Um, I think some of the newer ones, not really as great, but um, I think the original, uh, The Curse of the Black Pearl, the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie is the best mm. still. Um, the introduction of Jack Sparrow. Yeah. Johnny Depp is just, that's an iconic character. Yeah. But I do think that in Dead Man's Chest, the scene where they are on the island and they go up to the... Um, like little mill thing and the the uh water wheel breaks off and they're rolling down the hill having a sword fight on the water wheel as it rolls and Johnny Depp is trapped underneath is like that's one of the best I think sword action sequences mm. in almost any movie I've seen I just thought it was creative well shot and actually the action looked good I the biggest takeaway from me is I remember not loving all the barnacle people mm-hmm. like I thought that was just too much yeah like that's what I remember from that movie now it's been a long time since I've seen it. I'm actually planning on going back and rewatching the Pirates mm-hmm. movies because it's been forever since I've seen yeah. any of them um, but that's what I remember from the yeah. second one is just it was too many barnacle people there are a lot because they're all part of the ship so yeah uh, that's just kind it's of just their lot in life I guess yeah. death. their yeah. lot in death yeah. um. And then I also watched Bad Boys Ride or Die, mm. and I really enjoyed it quite a bit. It reminded me very much of classic 90s action movie with a lot of explosions, a lot of color, a lot of, uh, at times, crude humor, and just really good um, really good interplay between Will Smith and Martin Lawrence's characters. They've spent quite a bit of time now in their lives <laughs> as these two characters yeah. interacting with one another, and you can tell that... Uh, they they really just they fit like a glove in that scenario so yeah. i would recommend that if you want to go see an action movie i would not take the kids to that one <laughs> if you want to take the kids to something go see inside out too yeah <laughs> cool uh two in for me this week i watched the documentary han zimmer hollywood rebel mm-hmm. on netflix um it's really good it's not that long but it's really good um it it talks about, and I, I guess so one of the things that I, the main thing I learned about this is how revolutionary Hans Zimmer was in the terms of processing of how he worked with directors. Things like being able to send previews of what the sound would sound like because he was one of the first ones to use computer technology in some of these. Whereas apparently this was new to me. It was good behind the scenes info. When a, a um, composer would would try to tell him what the theme was going to sound like. They would basically do it on the piano for him, even if like it wasn't supposed to be the piano as the main mm-hmm. instrument. Hans was able using the computer to be able to give you a snippet of what it would sound like with a full orchestra and give you a much more robust thing. And it was just a whole different way of doing things back and forth. And so just, just looking at some of the advances he made, some of the things he did and just how he talks about it is really fascinating and and the way he's learned to succeed it's, i highly recommend it. if you're at all into movie soundtracks or in some of the amazing works of Hans zimmer it's 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 really good it's on netflix um i also watched uh star wars episode one the phantom menace uh, i still maintain that i like this one more than a lot of other people do um yeah the jar jar isn't great you know some of the other stuff isn't great yeah the you know, there was probably an overuse of computer technology um, as he was trying to play around with all his new toys, George Lucas was. But there are elements about it I still do really like. And uh, the lightsaber battles are incredible, uh, especially at the end. The The character of Darth Maul is amazing, underutilized in that movie, but amazing. Um, I thought the performances from like Natalie Portman and Liam Neeson were really good. Uh, so there's a number of things to like about it, even though um, it is not highly regarded amongst the many of the Star Wars aficionados. Yeah, I mean, I I don't hate it. Yeah, 
Um, I watched it in the theater eight times when it came out yeah. the first time. So it's kind of hard to say that you hate a movie when you've invested that much yep. time and money into it. <laughs> um, I still think the original ones are far superior, but that doesn't mean that I don't mm-hmm. like it. Yeah. For, for what it and is. I think one of the things that comes with being a, a person who likes Star Wars and grew up on Star Wars, but wouldn't consider myself like a giant Star Wars guy is that I, I can be a little more open handed with it mm-hmm. than many of like the Star Wars really hardcore Star Wars people are. Um, so I think I benefit from that in this moment. I mean, and, and one of the things for both of us, our generation, is that this was the first Star Wars movie that was for us. Yeah. And I, I, I do think there's some emotional weight and resonance mm-hmm. to that for people our yeah. age. Because we grew up hearing about how big the Star Wars phenomenon was, but we never got to participate in it. This was the first moment where we got to participate in the Star Wars phenomenon. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, they had their special editions released before that that we got to go see. Mm-hmm. So we got this experience of seeing them in theaters. But that wasn't the same thing yeah. as like a new Star Wars movie mm-hmm. opening night in theaters. <laughs> Yeah, the special editions, I, I, I went and saw them in the theater, too. It was kind of like you were um, you were going to the theater to watch your dad's Star Wars movie with your dad. Yeah. And this was your own Star Wars movie yeah. when it came out. Yeah, sure. so I, I will say I think a lot of the slander for The Phantom Menace is overblown and unnecessary. Yeah. All right. Well, that's the show. Thank you, everybody, for tuning into Film for Fans. And uh, make sure you do visit filmforfans.com. Like, subscribe, tell your friends, all that good stuff. Until next time, enjoy the movies.